Thumbs up. All right. It's also considered commingling if I put my personal money into the earnest money account. Earnest money account is only for other people's money. There is one exception to this rule. Because the earnest money has to be held in an FDIC insured bank account, right? Some banks charge you a monthly fee to keep a bank open. $6 a month or whatever, right? So I can pay that because it is a maintenance fee on the bank account. So that money can be mine that I put in, but I can't try and hide 10 grand by putting it in the earnest money account. That's commingling. All right. Now, liquidated damages across the page on the next side. I wanna talk about these together because here's another thing that we misspeak all of the time and you need to understand this. Always try and remember my visual, here it is. Earnest money is a credit to the buyer. Liquidated damages is a credit to the seller. Earnest money is a credit to the buyer and it counts towards his purchase price. Liquidated damages is what the judge awards the seller and is a credit to the seller. So typically or technically, when a seller keeps a buyer's earnest money, he really doesn't. It changes names because earnest money is a credit to the buyer. Liquidated damages is what the judge awards the seller and then becomes a credit to the seller. So typically if you go in front of a judge, the judge is going to say, okay, Mr. Buyer, you didn't buy the house. I'm going to fine for the seller and I'm going to award him damages for you not buying. And usually the judge will look at the agent and go, how much earnest money are you holding? What he just asked me was, how much of the buyer's money am I holding? And I would say, your honor, I'm holding $500 earnest money. He says, okay. I fine in the amount of $500 to the seller as liquidated damages. Mr. Agent, give the seller the money. And now that earnest money I was holding whoop, becomes liquidated damages and now goes to the seller. The judge can award any amount he wanted. In that example of 10 grand, the judge awarded all 10,000, the whole purchase price. But typically, it's the amount of money we are holding as earnest because that amount of money is very easy to get to. Why? Because I already have it. We already have it. So, what I'm making sure you understand, and I don't want to beat the dead horse. If I, if I mention the word earnest money, I'm talking about money that is a credit to a buyer. If I say liquidated damages, that's a credit to the seller. Those two are numerically often equal, but they are two different things. So a seller technically does not keep earnest money. A seller gets awarded liquidated damages, which are paid out of the buyer's earnest money, which converts its name from earnest money to liquidated damage. And then you give it to the seller as a credit or a check. 
Once again, verbiage means a lot in this business. But we say it all the time. Well, we'll just keep the earnest money. Well, actually, you're going to keep liquidated damages. It's going to convert from earnest money to liquidated damages, and then we'll give it to the seller. Does it have to be by a judge's decision, or can it just be what they agree upon if there's a breach of contract? It can be what they agree upon. Okay. When we mutually release a purchase agreement, there are three check. Uh, there are two check boxes, and the one box says earnest money to be returned to the uh, buyer and the other one says earnest money to be given to the seller all right very seldom do you see a buyer surrender their earnest money sure. but it's on there so if you agree then we're all fine if the seller agrees to allow the buyer to have it back he can do that too all right And that comes about because of page 199. There could be contingencies in the purchase agreement, which allow for the buyer to get out of the agreement. A contingency is a, what's the best way to put it? It's an act or a, Trying to think of a different word for it. It's a condition. That's a better word. It's a condition that must be met to move the purchase agreement forward. It's a condition that must be met or achieved. And sometimes you hear the word cleared, cleared to move on or move forward with the purchase agreement. You can make anything in the world a contingency as long as you both agree. I will buy your property contingent upon my dog singing the alphabet by tomorrow. All right. Your dog would have to sing the alphabet for that purchase agreement to move forward. All right. That's a little stupid example. I had a deal several years ago where the buyer called me and said, this house just went on the market. It's in Meridian Hills. It's exactly where we wanna be. Can we go look at it? I said, sure. So we show up and the husband's standing there and he's like, hey, should have told you my wife's not here today. Really, dude? He's like, no, she's not a sales trip. She's a salesman. She'll be home tomorrow but we don't want to miss this house. So we looked at the house and he's like, I want to write an offer standing right here. So we wrote the offer subject to, or a condition or a contingent that his wife agree within 48 hours. All right. So literally, the next morning, I went with him to pick his wife up at the airport. And she comes out. This is the old days when you could still go out. She comes out and she's like, hey, honey, how are you? Uh, who's this? I'm like, I'm Raymond. I'm the realtor. Get in the car. So we literally got in the car, drove right to the house. Her luggage was in the trunk still. And she liked it. And we cleared the contingency or removed, and she signed saying, yes, I will be a buyer. So now that purchase agreement moved forward because we cleared that contingency. We inherently have three or four contingencies we work with. Financing is the most common one. The buyer has to qualify for a loan to buy the property. If the buyer can't get a loan, the seller has agreed to release him based on that contingent that he could not clear. 
And that's a case, Sarah, where the buyer would ask for a mutual release and the earnest money is returned to the buyer and the seller would say, well, sure, because that was a contingency and you couldn't clear it. So go ahead and go. We have a property appraisal. The property has to appraise for the value we've agreed on. There's property inspection contingencies. There's a new one now called a property, it's not new, let me take that back. It's an old one that went out of favor and actually is back in favor now. It's called a property sale contingency. All right, this is where the buyer of your house makes an offer contingent upon the sale of the house they are in now because the buyer needs the money from the sale of their current home as down payment to buy your home. So they would write you an offer contingent upon the sale of my home. Literally, that's how we bought this house you see right here. When we called the listing agent, I called the listing agent, I'm like, hey, Alan, it's Raymond. I said, the house in Nashville, I said, I've got a buyer for him, but I'm telling you right now, the buyer is hard to deal with. They're demanding, they're pushy. And he's like, geez, Raymond, why would you deal with that client? I said, because I sleep beside her. All right. No, I didn't say that. Uh, <laughs> so I called and said, hey, we want to write an offer. He's like, well, we already have an offer on this property, but it's contingent upon the sale of their house. I'm like, I can beat that offer because our offer is not contingent upon the sale of our house. Between my wife and I, we had the ability to have the two houses. So we did not require that contingency, which was a better offer. So he said, well, write me the offer and I'll let you know. So about two days later, he called us back and goes, hey, they couldn't perform, meaning they couldn't remove the contingency because they still haven't sold their home. So you're now on the bubble and we bought the house. So it was, and that contingency can be problematic for some buyers. I want to buy your home, but I can't do it till I sell mine. So they put that contingent in the purchase agreement so that if they can't sell, they can get out of it without being penalized. What's the general time frame on a contingency agreement? Is that negotiable? On the actual sale of the buyer's house, there's typically not a time frame. Okay. But when the seller gets a second offer, like we made a second offer, right? the contingency that the first offer wrote will put a time frame inside of their contingent, like 24 hours or 48 hours. Okay. And if they cannot remove that contingency within that 48 hours, they lose, all right? So it's typically 24, 48 hours, because let's face it, you know in a day if I can afford that second house or not, it's not gonna require you four months of math. So typically it's a 24, 48 hour before I get to step in and take over, which is what happened. Alan called us back and said, hey, they can't remove the contingency. So they're now out. We release them and you're in. And we bought this house. There's another one called a lien holder approval there on the bottom, 199. This is actually a newer one. Let's go back to remember the short sale that we discussed. A short sale is when a lender takes short the amount of money that is owed to them. 
and I think Cameron's mentioned it as a risk mitigation thing. The bank doesn't want to have to go to court and sue and the share sale and all that, and then in the long run end up only getting any 80 anyway. So why not take 80 now? Well, if they agree to that, there has to be a verbal, not verbal, a written proof of that under this contingency that says, I will sell you my $100,000 house for 80 contingent upon my lien holder approving the loan, approving this deal. All right. So what they're telling you is we'll take less than we owe as long as our bank agrees to it. Because if the bank, if they failed, if the, the if they fail to tell you that the bank has to agree, then in theory, you are still subject to selling me that house for 80. I don't care if you owe 100 or not. You better come to the table with the other 20 grand because you agreed to 80. See what I'm saying? Unless you told me it was subject to the lien holder accepting the 80. That's why this clause came about in the last decade. Because there were sellers that took an offer short and then the bank said, no, we're not taking a short sale. And the seller's like, oh, well, I guess I'm out. And the buyer's like, no, no, no. You bringing money to the table is irrelevant to what you agreed on. You agreed to sell to me for 80? Bring 20 grand, I don't care. That doesn't bother me a bit. I don't care that you owe 100. You can sell for anything you want. You just gotta clear the loan. And without the contingency of the bank saying yes, you could be subject to bringing money to the table. Okay, 